Ira Cal Black in the Shia, Kia Ani in the Shlan, Sanja Kine, Buses Chin, Ashinghe, Dasha Che, Ado, Torajini, Dasha Mele. I am a member of the Navajo Nation from Shanto, <clears throat> Shanto, Arizona, and I am the co working manager here at Change Labs. So thank you all for taking the time to, out of your day to be here with us. And first off, I'd like to give a brief introduction to Change Labs uh, for those who aren't uh, already familiar with our organization and what we do. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll turn the time over to our guests of the hour. Uh, first off, Change Labs is a native led and native controlled nonprofit organization based on the Navajo and Hopi reservations. Our goal and mission is to provide creative workspace, tools, resources, and knowledge for native entrepreneurs. <clears throat> How we accomplish our goals and mission is through our different programs. We have our co-working program, a business incubator program, <clears throat> and our kinship program currently. We're based in Tuba City, Arizona, and Chains Labs, um, all of our programs were developed to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem on the Navajo Nation, affecting societal norms on how Native populations perceive entrepreneurship, highlighting role models, building a network of peer and mentorship support, developing leadership capacity of participants, and growing the community of entrepreneurs on Native land. <clears throat> Here we have the mighty team that may help make Change Lab the great organization that it is today. And you guys can see my presentation all right, right? To talk about the co-working program, construction is currently underway on our new headquarters, which will be located right next to the Tuba City Chapter House on Main Street. For those who may not be familiar with what co-working space are, it is a community space for business owners and entrepreneurs to use to help operate and manage your business. Uh, this space in particular will serve our native entrepreneurs and the small business owners, especially those that face on the Navajo and Hopi nations in the Four Corners area. So later this year, we will have a brand new co-working space available for you to use. And some of the services that we'll be able to offer are some tools that we think could be really useful to you and your business. <clears throat> tools such as desk space, Wi-Fi access, color printing, in-person coaching sessions, and a lot more. Uh, we plan also plan to bring back monthly in-person trainings for those who are interested. And our list of co-working services is constantly being updated as far as how we plan to support our local entrepreneurs and business owners here at the new headquarters. And we are always open to new ideas <clears throat> on how we can better offer our services, how we can better serve our communities. So if you, can, if you have any ideas on how this co-working space can benefit your business, um, definitely let us know. We are open to them. Uh, we're really excited to bring this community space for everyone to help with building and growing your business. So please stay tuned for more information um, as we come closer and closer to completion of our construction and closer to grand opening, <clears throat> which should be very soon. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, here's a picture I took last weekend of our co-working space there in Tuba City. If you see there in the lower right corner is part of the Tuba City chapter building. And then there in the center on the bottom is the co-working space. One of our most popular questions we get here at Chains Labs is how do I start a business? All of our programs and services here are designed to help our native entrepreneurs, our artisans, our local vendors, and those we like to call change makers because that's what our local artisans and our entrepreneurs and business owners are, your change makers. <clears throat> if you're a native entrepreneur or a small business owner yourself, please know that you're absolutely crucial to our local economies and Change Labs is here to help you both start up and strengthen your business. Now for a brief overview of the business incubator program, <clears throat> it is one of the only native led business incubators for native entrepreneurs in this country. And we're right here on the Navajo Nation on the border of the Hopi Nation. This program is led by our director of business incubation, Cecilia So. And starting this year, it is a six month program for native entrepreneurs who want support and training on how to start and operate your business. <clears throat> if you're interested and would like assistance with things like your logo, your website design, or how to set up and maintain your bookkeeping and finances, please visit our website for more information at nativestartup.org slash incubator. And then next is another question that we get often is how do I get help running my business? There are so many aspects to being an entrepreneur and the answer or solution that you may be searching for may not always be obvious. <clears throat> uh, here at um, Chains Labs, one of our driving factors is kin kinship, uh, building relationships among our communities, our entrepreneurs and our nations and how Chains Labs there can help there is through our business coaching appointments. We offer free virtual 90 minute appointments with any of our business coaches 
Our coaches are available on Mondays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and they each have their own area of expertise depending on the kind of support you're looking for. We have a team of very bright and very eager coaches. They're each incredibly knowledgeable in their specialties and will be able to assist you where you're needing help with your business. The coaches are able to assist you in areas from marketing to accounting to bookkeeping systems, or if you're just starting out, they can assist you with creating a business model and navigating an abonation systems for things such as your business site lease, your um, registration with the business net, uh, navigation business regulatory, because those can be a little tricky as well. <clears throat> as far as understanding what the process. Um, this coming Monday, we have, I believe, Coach Jessica. <clears throat> um, so if you want to find more information or book your appointments with, with Jess, Coach Jessica or any of our coaches, uh, you can definitely find them at the link here, nativestartup.org slash event. And then another common question we get here at Chains Labs is how do I create a website? Until Chains Labs can go back to hosting open studio hours that are um, HQ in Tuba City, we will refer you all to our YouTube channel. We currently have over 50 recorded sessions and discussions, each designed for Native business owners and all led by Native entrepreneurs and creatives. <clears throat> Our workshops are, have covered topics like social media marketing, website design, doing business on the Navajo Nation, and a lot more. It's a growing archive and uh, has a lot of shared knowledge from other Native and um, other people in Chase Lab Network as well, who really want to see our Native people thrive and their businesses thrive as well. <clears throat> To access many of our past sessions and our listings of resources, such as grants and other informational events, we um, I'll refer you to our link here, nativestartup.org slash resources. We update this page pretty regularly, so please check in every now and then for upcoming opportunities. Another great resource we have to offer are our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and Twitter. I do recommend you also check those out for regular postings and updates as well. Chains Labs likes to post from Many of our partners and others are in our network for great opportunities and resources that we think would be useful to all of our Native creatives, our Native business owners, and our Native entrepreneurs. And lastly, there's a whole spectrum of who we um, who are considered Native entrepreneurs, and we here at Chain Labs have been curating our own list of them. If you're in the market for finding other Native service providers who can help you with your business, we have over 600 Native-owned businesses listed in here that we think are really, really great resources for helping you to start up your and run your business. Or maybe you're searching for some Native-made products. Now you can definitely visit the site here at reservizing.org. And if you're a Native business owner or entre entrepreneur yourself and you have services or products that you'd like to promote, feel free to add yourself to the listing. It's free and it's a very fairly simple process. All right. <clears throat> if you have any questions at all about Chains Labs or you're interested in any of our services and would like to know where to start, feel free to email me. My direct email is here, Raquel at nativestartup.org slash, not slash, and, or you can visit Chains Labs at nativestartup.org. And now, if before we get started with our guest speaker for today, I want to touch on our workshop etiquette and how we can be respectful of our guest time today. We do ask that you stay on mute during the presentation unless you're called on. Um, but do feel free to populate the chat box with your questions or raise your virtual hand and we'll make sure to get them before the end of our session today. Also, a reminder, our session is being recorded um, today and will be available on YouTube later this week on Chains Labs YouTube. All right, introducing our guest for today, Carletta Jones. <clears throat> we have Carletta, she's uh, the NET CIA CPA individual. She is very, very bright. Uh, she was going to be talking to us about best practices as far as operations and internal controls. So thank you so much for being here, Carletta. I will turn the time over to you. Great. Thank you, Raquel. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. First of all, thank you, Change Labs, for your tireless and impactful efforts to foster the creation of Native American businesses and providing this opportunity for learning and growth for Native entrepreneurs. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you to everyone attending virtually. This workshop where we'll be diving into concepts related to best practices for your business and internal controls. I hope it will be useful and helpful in your business. Hello, everyone. My name is Carletta Jones. I am Dine 
and my clans are Red House, Zia Weaver, Red Bottom, and Red Running Into the Water. I should also mention I'm a huge Red Sox fan. I'm originally from Standing Rock, New Mexico. For anyone not familiar with this area of the Navajo Nation, it is located on this map as the Red Star on the Eastern Agency, but it may not be to scale. It is further complemented with a picture depicting what? A standing rock. I relocated to Flagstaff in the late 90s to attend NAU. I graduated from NAU with an accounting degree, a baby boy and a husband. Baby boy and the husband were in the recruiting paperwork. My career has spanned a couple of decades with most of my work in public accounting as an independent auditor and accounting service professional for public and private businesses as well as nonprofits and governmental entities. I am a certified public accountant and certified internal auditor. Currently, I manage a $20 million budget in the WA Frankie College of Business and operate my accounting practice, Red House Accounting and Consulting in my spare time. I am an active member of the Accounting and Financial Women's Alliance, Flagstaff Chapter, or AFWA for short. Here's a picture of the ladies that make up the Flagstaff Chapter. I also serve as a board director for AFWA National, which is based in Kentucky, and the Museum of Northern Arizona, based in Flagstaff. My husband and I have been raising our family in Flagstaff since the early 2000s. We have three boys, and time has flown by. We now have three, or I'm sorry, we, are now, we now have two college students, one at ASU and one at NAU. Our youngest is a junior at Flag High. So to break these very exciting topics of best practices and internal controls into bite-sized pieces, we'll cover three major areas under each topic. Anybody in the mood for a Twinkie right about now? The presentation is jam-packed with information like Friday Night Basketball at Warrior, Warrior Pavilion or Wildcat Den. The intent is to provide an overview of each of these topics. Operation best practices. We will cover the why, how and what of your business. I'll use the terms business operation, company, and organization interchangeably throughout the presentation. Mission and vision response to the why. Why does your company exist? To contribute to the local, regional, national, or even international economy? To provide a service or product that is meaningful to you and your customers? To establish a legacy that will be passed on to your children? We'll review the importance of defining your company's purpose and intent, especially with regard to measuring progress of achieving company goals. Strategic planning responds to the how. How will your company achieve its goals? Strategic planning ties directly to mission and vision and is a way to measure goal progress and or achievement. Policies and procedures respond to the what. What should my business focus on with regard to company goals, company expectations, and regulations? We'll touch on regulation and its impact on policy, and we'll review the difference between policies and procedures, and I'll share several examples. Internal controls. We'll review examples of prevent and detect controls, your responsibility as an owner to monitor business operations, and finally, we'll wrap up with exploring several real world examples of internal control breakdowns. So let's get started by reviewing the importance of mission and vision. The mission and vision statements play three critical roles. First, they communicate the purpose, which may or may not include values of the organization to stakeholders. This is the why that I talked about previously. Why does the company exist? What is its purpose? And how does it plan to serve its stakeholders? Stakeholders vary and may include customers, employees, lenders, suppliers, owners, and government, and the community. Second, it informs strategy development by defining the objective or objector, objectives for goal congruence. And third, it develops the measurable goals and objectives by which to gauge the success of the organization's strategy. Your mission and vision statements are helpful to writing your business business plan with regard to the executive summary and company description, and will allow you to think through what you should include in organization and management, as well as the service or product line sections of your business plan. Your mission and vision statements are the beginning of your company story and delivering your business pitch to various audiences, whether they are investors, customers, or financial institutions. Your business started because of a thought you had that morphed into an idea and then a vision eventually realized 
by the existence of your business. Not all businesses have a mission or a vision statement. Your business may not have one and that's okay. Businesses that define its purpose and future aspirations are better positioned to develop a strategy and measure against that strategy based on their purpose and where they see themselves in the future. Does anyone have a mission and our vision statement they would be willing to share? If you do, please share it in the chat box. And while you're typing, I'll share examples of mission and vision statements. We'll jump into strategy as part of our discussion on strategic planning later on in the presentation. So while you're typing, I'm going to move on to the examples of mission and vision statements from real organizations. So my chapter, actually my old chapter, I'm now with Cameron chapter, has a vision statement. I mentioned I serve as a board of director on two different organizations, the Accounting and Financial Women's Alliance and the Museum of Northern Arizona. AFWA does not have a vision statement. MA just went through a strategic planning process that resulted in a new mission and vision statement. To ensure my team and leadership understood why the Financial Oversight Department exists within the College of Business, I created a mission statement. So let's go ahead and review each of these ones. So for Standing Rock, the vision statement reads, to protect traditional and cultural values to achieve sustainability for, and I know I'm gonna butcher this, I apologize, Sa'i Ahi community and its future generations. The Museum of Northern Arizona's mission is a gateway to understanding the Colorado Plateau, engaging local, regional, and global audiences with life-enriching knowledge and experiences. Its new vision is to illuminate the connections between people, place, and time through science, art, and culture. AFWA's mission is to enable women in accounting and finance fields to achieve their full potential and contribute to their profession. The financial oversight's mission in the College of Business is to provide accurate, timely, and complete financial data, information, and reports that are critical to educated decision-making by FCB leadership and management. So now I'm gonna go ahead and check the chat box to see if anybody has, feels comfortable enough sharing their mission or vision statement. Okay, we'll move on to the next section. All right, um, so my mission statement uh, is to create new and fun inventive ways to learn the Diné language or Diné Keche, sorry, and to reinstate uh, the Diné way of living in this modern age. Now that's perfect. Yeah, and your mission statement kind of holds to the purpose and your vision really is for future aspirations. And you'll see kind of how all of this ties together to strategy, um, because if you understand your pretty much why you exist, right? <laughs> why your business exists, what its purpose is, it's then easy to define the expectations that you want to achieve for the future. So thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Uh, I have one. This is Rodell. So what I started with, it might change a little bit, but uh, it's a Native American influence design blended with 21st century vision you can wear. Oh, nice. Yeah, and it, and it offers a sense of creativity, right? So you want to, especially in this day and age with social media and trying to capture attention, you know, you kind of want to have a spin on it. Again, not compromising the purpose behind why your company exists, though, because obviously you value certain things. You believe in your product or service. So you want to make sure that you encourage that in the mission statement, too. Anybody else? So just for fun, I wanted to share the mission and vision. And I feel like my tape for my video thing is not working the greatest. So I can only see part of my face. But just for fun, I wanted to share the mission and vision statements for something near and dear to our hearts. Spam. You can see what their vision and mission were way back when in 2006. It reads just like a vision and mission statement. And basically, they've tr transitioned um, today to a purpose statement or a North Star. Same concept, just different terminology. Purpose statement relates to mission. North Star relates to vision. Blake's um, had a site, and they had plenty of pictures of, of delicious burgers, but I couldn't find a mission or vision statement. So I guess the burgers spoke for themselves. Um, I got really hungry when I started making this, this slide, so I sent my son to uh, go get fast food for us. Unfortunately, Flagstaff doesn't have a Blake's, though. Um, and then the Cortez Milling Company that produces Bluebird Flower, their domain expired, so I wasn't able to locate a mission or vision statement for Bluebird. Okay, so next we'll review how mission and vision fit with strategic planning and how it contributes to market analysis that encapsulates various categories 
for your business plan, such as service or product line, marketing and sales, and financial projections. Strategic planning is a process in which an organization's leaders define their vision for the future and identifies the organization's goals and objectives. The process includes establishing the sequence in which those goals should be realized so that the organization can reach its stated vision. An easy acronym to summarize this process is SWOT, Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. A SWOT analysis helps to analyze your organization to identify a successful strategy for the future. As you can see from the slide, the analysis is based on questions to help you get started with your analysis. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on the call has done um, such an analysis or can, you know, a lot of these questions that are listed on here, I apologize, I'm trying to adjust my, my, my video or my camera. Um, but does anybody um, want to go off of mute and share um, any strengths that they have or weaknesses? Um, I think a lot of the threats that are pretty common among all any business is going to be competition. But if anybody is willing to share their strengths or weaknesses, feel free to unmute. I think one of my uh, weaknesses is uh, procrastination. So I need to work on that a little more. I'm there with you. <laughs> Hello, this is Marco Arviso. I think one of my weaknesses is, um, uh, one of them is uh, social um, media with our marketing and also just marketing in general. Yeah, I, I think definitely in this day and age, marketing kind of has pivoted a little bit. So trying to have those catch lines um, is interesting. And then just the posting regarding it, right? I think um, one of my weaknesses is, I think the best way to describe it is I'm following through. <laughs> Just following through with things um it's not quite procrastination it's just when you start something and you get to a certain point you got over a hurdle and then after that it feels like you're done but there's still a ways to go and it's trying to finish up that last bit and it's quite difficult for me to just finish that no i i can definitely relate to that so um i just actually have been in the college of business for a little over a year i want to say and um, similar approach, basically, we um, are trying to revamp and recreate, in some instances, policies and procedures. And to me, again, I believe policies and procedures are critical to communicating job responsibilities to employees, to making sure that we're compliant with different regulations, right? There's so much importance regarding policies and procedures, and it's a foundational concept. Um, but in our college, we're lacking in that. And so we're trying to build upon build upon those things there. And so you kind of like you described, you get over one hurdle and then you're trying to get to the next hurdle. And, and again, it's just trying to, you know, get those things there. Um, but again, you're, you're limited in bandwidth and time. So anybody else want to share? Maybe even on any of the other categories, strengths, opportunities, or threats. I think just real quick on the strengths, at least for our college, I know that we're really um, being innovative and we actually, I didn't mean to put this in the slide or promote um, my college, but um, there is a program that we offer, which is the MBA in healthcare specialization. Um, and since healthcare is very critical to um, many tribes, um, they offer a program that is in partnership with Dignity Health. And so it's a really quality program. It's online. So anybody from anywhere in the world can take these classes. Um, so I think that's a strength um, in our area for sure. Okay, anybody else wanna share anything before we move on? Okay, so we'll discuss the SWAN analysis and review an example of the results of an analysis from Upper Crest Pies, which is a specialty meat and fruit pie cafe in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. They sell hot, ready-to-go pies and frozen take-home options, as well as an assortment of fresh salads and beverages. I'll then share the museum's, uh, Museum of Northern Arizona's planning process, which was equivalent to the SWOT analysis and how that resulted in a new mission and vision statement, as well as strategic goals and objectives. So you may think that you already know everything that you need to do to succeed, but a SWOT analysis will force you to look at your business in new ways and from new directions. You'll look at your strengths and weaknesses and how you can leverage those to take advantage of the opportunities and threats that exist in your market. How to use your SWOT analysis. With your SWOT analysis complete, you're ready to convert it to a real strategy. 
After all, the exercise is about producing a strategy that you can work on during the next few months. The first step is to look at your strengths and figure out how you can use those strengths to take advantage of your opportunities. Then look at how your strengths can com combat the threats that are in the market. Use this analysis to produce a list of actions that you can take. With your action list in hand, look at your company calendar and start placing goals or milestones on it. What do you want to accomplish in each calendar quarter or month moving forward? You'll also want to do this by analyzing how external opportunities might help you combat your own internal weaknesses. Can you also minimize those weaknesses so you can avoid the threats that you identified? Again, you'll have an action list that you'll want to prioritize and schedule. So going back to Upper Crest Pie's example, based on their SWOT analysis, there are a few potential strategies for growth that translate the SWOT analysis into actionable goals. So if we look at their SWOT analysis, you'll see that under strengths, they've identified a couple of, well, they've actually identified three strengths, location, uniqueness, and strong management. And you can read each one of those ones there. Under weaknesses, it's lack of capital and reputation. Oh, I apologize. And then under opportunities, uh, there are two, one related to growth and then identifying a market segment, which is working families with children. And then under threats, as I said, I think competition is always going to be a threat for any company. And then being unprepared for opening numbers. So a few potential strategies for growth for Upper Crest Pie includes because of their lack of capital, they could investigate um, investors. Upper, cry, upper, upper Crest Pies might investigate its option for obtaining capital. Create a marketing plan because Upper Crest Pies wants to execute a specific marketing strategy, targeting working families by emphasizing that their dinner option is both healthy and convenient. The company should develop a marketing plan. And that's really because the opportunity, opportunity identified as, as far as working families with children is that two-income families have less time to prepare a meal. Um, the third one is plan a grand opening. A key piece of that marketing plan will be the store's grand opening and the promotional strategies necessary to get Upper Crest Pie's target market in the door. Now we'll review a strategic plan close to home related to the Museum of Northern Arizona. So similar to the SWOT analysis we just reviewed, m and strategic planning process followed the same concepts of SWOT. So over several months, m and undertook a wide ranging and thoughtful process of research and discovery, led by a strategic advisory group consisting of four trustees and four staff members, which culminated in the strategic plan. To facilitate this work, m and engaged the service of museum planning firm, Lord Cultural Resources. Having worked with the museum in the past, the Lord team had a fundamental understanding of the overall context in which the museum operates. The strategic planning process was conducted in two phases. Phase one focused on research, data collection, and consultation. Phase two focused on strategy development. Phase one included an environmental scan presentation, an internal and external assessment, this research process involved a number of inputs, including engagement from over 100 individuals through surveys, interviews, and group discussions that included five tribal roundtable and consultations, 16 board members interviewed, seven individual staff interviews, 65 volunteer survey responses, three staff workshops, and 20 external stakeholders interviewed, hence the several months of planning. Research included in phase one was a benchmarking study comprised of data surveys and interviews with five peer institutions across the country, and a digital assessment studying, studying M&A's external digital footprint and internal capabilities. The research process provided insights into M&A's strengths, weaknesses, needs, and ambitions, as well as opportunities and challenges that would shape its future, pretty much equivalent to the SWOT analysis. Phase two began with a five-part five key findings report, which compiled the research outcomes of phase one and identified the most significant challenges and opportunities facing the museum. The key findings report was issued in, in advance of a two-part strategic planning workshop that focused on eliciting and capturing feedback from the museum's board of trustees. 
Out of these discussions emerged the draft strategic plan and updates to MA's mission and vision statements. So similar to the example of the SWOT analysis that we looked at earlier, the SWOT analysis results in goals and objectives. The MA's strategic planning resulted in five goals and objectives. The goals and accompanying objectives set the stage for MA's future, giving focus to activity across the organization, creating alignment of activity and an understanding of impact for all staff. They offer a framework for the development of yearly operational plans with measurable outcomes, ensuring that the strategy, strategy lives on, guiding the organization through its daily operations, both now and into the future. Five goals were identified, like I said, and the first three are included on this slide here. Activate the comprehensive and integrated mission and vision. Because the strategic plan resulted in a, in a new mission and vision statement for m and some things of importance included rebalancing its operations around the new mission and vision effectively and effectively communicating it to various constituents. The second goal was to make lifelong, lifelong learning and education the heart of what m and does. Objectives, or objectives around this goal highlight intentional teams and programming to establish robust relationships to grow and share knowledge. The third goal is to grow the audience in depth and breadth that highlight honing in on m and audiences to promote the user and visitor experience by being intentional with exhibitions and programs based on user and visitor feedback. feedback I'm sorry. This in turn will contribute to a strategic and intentional marketing, marketing and outreach plan. I was not able to fit the other two goals on this slide, but the fourth goal relates to creating a comprehensive and diversified financial plan that includes evaluating revenue sources and exploring entrepreneurial opportunities to name a few. The fifth goal is to develop a full digital potential, which includes defining a strategy for digital audience engagement and promoting digital proficiency in the work culture. So now that we've reviewed two examples of SWOT analysis, we'll move into the nuts and bolts of your operations related to policies and procedures. You'll see how mission, vision, and the SWOT analysis contribute to these foundational practices. The world is full of policies. For example, family make policies like no TV until homework is done. I know I've said that several times. Stores have return policies. Workplace have policies about things such as vacation or sick days. Policies provide guidance, consistency, accountability, efficiency, and clarity on how an organization operates. Policies are not fun, but it is important for your business businesses. Policies are driven by business philosophy, external and internal risks, competition, and laws or regulations. Policies are rule ma rules made by organizations to achieve their goals. Specifically, policies connect the mission to individual conduct. As we discuss the importance of why the company exists, policies help connect your company's purpose to your employees. Policies establish requirements for employees of the organization. It defines expectations and lays out requirements for your employees. Policies ensure compliance with applicable laws and regulations. This is highlighted in every aspect of any business, especially within human resource policies. For example, Equal Employment Opportunity Act, Safe Working Environment, Americans with Disabilities Act, to name a few. And finally, policies promote efficiency and reduce risk. If expectations are clearly communicated based on the company's purpose, it helps your employees understand their role and reduces risk especially when it comes to laws and regulations. Some common policies and procedures in the workplace include code of conduct, in internet and email policy, drug and alcohol policy, dress code policy. At NAU, we have a plethora of policies from the academic side to financials to research. You name it, we probably have it. Does anybody care to share any policies and procedures that they might have already established? If so, please go ahead and um, unmute and share anything that you might might want to with the with the group. Hello, this is Marco. Uh, we do have a um, an opening procedure for our business store, kind of like the days and out of uh, how we the daily 
run of how we open our store and what we're supposed to do, like, um, and then also like locking stuff at night, like turning on the alarms and locking the safe and kind of like things like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and those are all important roles, right? To making sure that um, people understand what needs to happen. Um, a lot of times we might take for granted, oh, lock up the store. Well, what does that mean, right? So um, if your store involves the cash, cash registers and petty cash, you know, counting that down, running reports for sales for the day, um, all of those things need to be encapsulated as part of the opening and closed procedures. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So if you've not had a chance to create policies, let's discuss the steps to drafting policies. First, prioritize a policy list. You can't write every policy at once, and some are more important than others, so create a list of policies that need to be done first. Keep it simple and general. Policies should be written in plain language. Policies cannot contemplate all possible situations. Policies should be written broadly, but with enough clarity to apply to varying circumstances. Detailed guidance can be provided in FAQs or in procedures. Conduct research by reviewing regulations specific to your organization. For example, the Navajo Nation has the Navajo Nation Code, which is equivalent to the Arizona Revised Statute in its setup. They are essentially regulations for a multitude of categories from the Navajo Nation government to elections to taxation. Some of the some that may apply that may be applicable to your business operations include Title V, Commerce and Trade, Title 12, Fiscal Matters, Title 15, Labor, Title 20, Professions and Occupations, and Title 24, Taxation. Write an initial draft. There are plenty of resources online that you can use, and I'll share a few examples um, at the end of the presentation. Validate the procedures. We'll talk about what this means in the next section, but first I want to show an example of a policy for onboarding and verifying employment eligibility. This policy taken from Western Washington University outlines the definitions and requirements related to onboarding and verifying employment eligibility. The outline is general and basic. Definitions are critical to effective communication with employees to ensure everyone is on the same page. Section 1A and B states verify the identity and employment eligibility of all employees in accordance with applicable laws and guidelines and preclude unlawful employment. Based on these statements, the policy references regulation related to equal employment opportunity, which falls under the Civil Rights Act and is regulated by the US Department of Labor. Now let's look at a corresponding procedure related to this policy. Here's an example of a procedure related to the onboard policy that we just looked at before. There's no one best way to create your procedures, so pick the best approach and what makes sense to you. However, key things to include in your procedures, procedures are reference to the applicable policy or policies. You can see this procedure references the onboarding and verifying employment eligibility policy. And it, it should also reference additional resources as appropriate. In this example, they have a site dedicated to new hire information and then identify steps or action and who is responsible for those steps, steps or actions. This provides expectations and assigns responsibility to the appropriate employee. In this procedure example, responsible parties include the hiring department, HR, the new hire, and so on. Now we'll transition to our next section related to internal controls. Internal controls are the mechanism, rules, and procedures implemented by a company to ensure the integrity of financial and accounting information, promote accountability, and prevent fraud. Internal controls aid companies in complying with laws and regulations and preventing employees from stealing assets or committing fraud. They also can help improve operational efficiency by improving the accuracy and timeliness of financial reporting. Five components that make up a company's internal contr control system include control environment. A control environment establishes for all employees the importance of integrity and a commitment to revealing and rooting out improprieties, including fraud. A board of directors and management create this environment and lead by example. Management must put into place the internal systems and personnel to facilitate the goals of internal controls. Risk assessment. 
a company must regularly assess and identify the potential for or existence of risk or loss. Based on the findings of such assessments, added focus and levels of control might be implemented to ensure the containment of risk or to watch for risk in related areas. Monitor. A company must monitor its system of internal controls for ongoing viability. By doing so, it can ensure whether through system updates, adding employees, or necessary employee training, the continued ability of internal controls, controls to function as needed. Information and communication. Solid information and consistent communication are important on two fronts. First, clarity of purpose and roles can set the stage for successful internal controls. Second, facilitating the understanding of and commitment to steps to take can help employees do their job most effectively. And finally, control activities. These pertain to the processes, policies, and other courses of action that maintain the integrity of internal controls and regulatory compliance. They involve preventative and detective activities. Internal controls are typically comprised of controlled activities such as authorization, documentation, reconciliation, security, and the separation of duties. They are broadly divided into preventative and detective activities. Preventative control activities aim to deter errors or fraud from happening in the first place and include thorough documentation and authorization practices. Separation of duties, a key part of this process, ensures that no single individual is in a position to authorize record and be in the custody of a financial transaction and the resulting asset. Authorization of invoices and verification of expenses are internal controls. In addition, preventative control, internal controls include limiting physical access to equipment, inventory, cash, and other assets. Detective controls are backup procedures that are designed to catch items or events that have been missed by the first line of defense. Here, the most important activity is reconciliation, which is used to compare data sets. Corrective action is taken upon finding material differences. Other detective controls include external audits from accounting firms and internal audits of assets, such as inventory. Some general best practices also include passwords for accounting programs, having an audit trail within the accounting software, so it identifies who created edited or deleted a transaction. Additionally, based on the code, some accounting programs can be set up to disallow certain users from various modules within the accounting system. For example, accounts receivable should not be accessed by sales employees. Limitations of internal controls um, exist regardless of the policies and procedures established by an organization. Internal controls can only provide reasonable assurance that a company's financial information is correct. The effectiveness of internal controls can be limited by human judgment. For example, a business may give high-level person personnel the ability to override internal controls for operational efficiency reasons. We'll, we'll review a real example related to management override later in the presentation. Internal controls can be circumvented through collusion, where employees whose work activities are normally separated by internal controls work together to, in secret to conceal fraud or other misconduct. We'll now review one process that is universal to any organization, the accounts receivable cycle, or the process of collecting cash from your customer as a result of sales or services or products. This chart reflects the cycle for selling products and or services from setting up the customer in the accounting system, specifically the accounts receivable module, to collecting and processing their payment, whether that was received as cash, check, or credit card. The purpose of accounts receivable internal controls is to ensure that sales invoices are properly recorded and that customers pay promptly in accordance with their agreed terms of business. Pretty much all the rights, right customer account, right amount, right product and or service. Key con controls to consider are proofread invoices. Again, speaking to all the rights, right customer, right amount, right product, right service. Authorized credit memos. If a refund is issued, which employee or pl employees have authority to authorize credit memos? Generally, that should be a supervisor um, in your organization. Restrict access to the billing software. 
Sales staff should not have access to the billing software, for example, if sales are based on commission. Segregate duties. Ensure that not one person is handling the entire process. And we'll see an example of this uh, later on in the presentation. And review sales activity, accounts receivable aging schedules, credit memo reports, and we'll touch more on this in the next slide related to reviewing financial activity. So you wear many hats as a business owner, from managing your team, maintaining vendor relationships, to promoting and selling your product or service. But these are, but there are important things that you should consider in monitoring your business operations. First, communicate expectation, expectations with your employees. Policies and procedures can help in this area. This also identifies training opportunities as necessary. Review your financial activities, whether that's reviewing your bank statement and bank reconciliations occasionally, and you'll see why this is, this is imp important in our first case study. Review your revenues and related expenses. As you start to review these statements, you'll become comfortable with the structure and can start identifying trends. For example, you may notice seasonal activity. Evaluate your process. This is really from the perspective of internal control. Is one employee handling all aspects of a transaction? If so, you may need to consider updating that process. And finally, don't stop learning. Reach out to peers, mentors, do your own research, or even engage a professional to help. And obviously with the Tom Cruise references, I'm pretty much dating myself here. Um, we'll look at some study cases of real examples of fraud due to weak or no internal controls. Has anyone heard of or watched All the Queen's Horses? This was on Netflix. Every time I watch it, I'm so engaged. It is just mind blowing how she was able to commit such a fraud. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and then I'll reshare the video that we're gonna be watching regarding this. It's a short video. Do you think you were just smarter than everybody else, Rita? Fifteen-three plus million dollars is just unbelievable. She lived quite a life, totally different life than what she portrayed here. By day, she's wearing municipal clothes, and by night, she's dripping with jewels and furs. She had this grand, high-stakes horse empire. My first thought was, Dixon has that much money that you could invest that much money off a little tiny place like this. People just trusted her so well, more than anything. Rita, how did you go to bed and not think, whose lives I'm infecting here? I didn't think that guy wanted to find out. Did she do this alone? I haven't seen it, but now I want to. <laughs> That's all the Queen's Horses on Netflix, you said, Helena? Yeah, uh, that is all the Queen's Horses, and it is on Netflix. I'm sure it might be streamed on other, other, other things that are out there as well, because we'll jump into the details regarding uh, that fraud. Um, but I want to say it's like a little over an hour as far as that um, video goes. It's, it's very interesting. Um, I think fraud is just... Um, it's mind blowing to me. Um, I just don't know how people can commit those things and, and look at themselves in the mirror. It's just, it's unbelievable. So Rita Cranwell was the comptroller and treasurer of Dixon, Illinois from 1983 to 2012, which had 16,000 residents and had an annual budget of less than $10 million. She stole $53 million over a 20 year period. And mind you, annual audits were performed and budgets were approved by city council. She used the funds to build a quarter horse breeding empire by forcing budget cuts and neglecting public infrastructure. She accomplished this, she accomplished this theft for this long by having too much trust. She opened a secret bank account in the name of the city under the acronym RSDCA that stood for Reserve Sewer Development Construction Account where she was the only authorized check signer. 
While this account existed at the bank, it didn't exist in the city's accounting system. Therefore, any bank activity of deposits or disbursements were not captured in any official accounting system. Crundwell made deposits into this secret account from the city's legit capital project fund checking account. So from the bank's perspective, this appeared legit as it was from the capital project fund to the reserve sewer development construction account. To provide validity to the disbursements from the legit bank account, which was the capital project fund, she created fictitious invoices from the Illinois Department of Transportation. While she was on an extended vacation, a replacement was hired. This individual requested all bank statements. And as the bank statements were reviewed, the secret bank account was discovered. Soon after, the mayor contacted the FBI. She was sentenced to 19 and a half years in prison, but she did not serve her entire sentence and now lives with her brother in the same town she defrauded. The control weakness was lack of segregation of duties. Rita could write checks, she could approve payments, she could create and monitor the budget, she could enter transactions into the accounting system, and she could reconcile this, the bank statements. So what are some key takeaways from this example? It proves that it is criti critically important that multiple people perform accounting functions to separate duties, and vacations should be mandatory, which not only allows for cross-training training among staff, but also allows for different eyes on the process. Your business bank statements should be requested from the bank and analyzed. The mission, vision, and SWOT analysis helps you better understand your business. Policies and procedures promote employee expectations related to their functions, inc including accounting functions and continued monitoring of your business operations will be beneficial. For example, if you have a budget, which is a completely separate topic on its own, can the variance between budget and actual be explained? And does that explanation make sense? Right now, we'll go ahead and discuss another example of fraud, but within our state. Fraud in our state that results in a report is provided by the Arizona Auditor General. This 2022 report reflects over 980,000 in total losses, 25 criminal charges, and three government entities impacted. If you go to the Arizona Auditor General's website, it provides additional details into the fraud, and it doesn't only include the year 2022. There's previous years on there. Two of the many examples from this 2020 report that I wanted to discuss was this were, were um, two Wilson Elementary School District budget accounting specialists separately embezzled a total of over 32,000 when they issued themselves unauthorized district checks with forged signatures. A Glendale Elementary School District payroll technician manipulated the district's payroll software, enabling her to use 77 hours of leave twice, resulting in a district overpayment of a little over 1,600. Charges in these cases ranged from theft, misuse of public monies, forgery to conflict of interest, and falsifying records. These individuals were sentenced to incarceration, probation, and community service, and were required to pay restitution, fines, and costs. These are examples that the Arizona Auditor General reviews for the state of Arizona, and this just goes to show that fraud can happen anywhere by anyone. And fraud is a topic on its own that involves motivation, opportunity, and rationalization. There could be a whole separate pres presentation just talking about fraud and breaking it down. But in summary, as a business owner, you can control motivation to an extent. With rationalization out of your control, but you do have the power to control opportunity. Establishing foundational policies and procedures with internal controls in mind as a result of your mission, vision, and strategy can help prevent opportunity for employees to take advantage of your business. Here are a list of websites for resources related to the topics we covered today regarding mission and vision, strategic planning, policies and procedures, and internal controls. Thank you again to everyone who participated in this information-packed presentation. I truly hope it has provided some insight for your business. Are there any questions?
Um, I have a quick question, sis, um, Mackenzie. Yes. Um, I was just kind of wondering, because I know that most of us here are just beginning and are like the very small businesses. So I know it in the um, presentation, you said it's good to have um, different individuals for different pieces, but what would you recommend if you don't have that manpower to, to do that? That's a great question. And when I worked in public accounting here in Flagstaff, we encountered a lot of those instances where it was small mom and pop shops that you know had limited accounting staff. And so um, trying to achieve segregation of duties was challenging for them. Um, what we would encourage though with that is obviously um, if one person is involved in the entire process, if there would be a review from the owner's perspective to review those things, basically looking at your bank reconciliations, I think that's really key. So if that individual is performing the bank reconciliations, but they're also involved in um, handling the entire process, um, you should be looking at those reconciliations and looking at your bank statements to make to making sure that um, things appear legit. Uh, the other options too, and I don't know if the banks do that here in town, but there's such a thing as um, drop boxes. So say that you have an individual that did the accounting piece of it, then you as the owner, perhaps as you're running around, you know, doing various errands, can then that, take that to the bank um, in the drop box. Um, and they can then make the deposits from there um, for you on your behalf. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Hi, this is Elaine. I just wanted to know if I can take a quick glance at the resource page again. Absolutely. Let me go back. And these are just basically one set of examples. There are numerous examples um, that exist out there. And again, trying to put this presentation, keeping kind of the, the, the smaller businesses in mind, I think the intent really behind this presentation was to provide those underlying concepts that are foundational to no matter what size the company is. Um, when you think about Walmart or Target or even those larger restaurant chains, right? These are foundational concepts that they implement. So obviously there are a few of you that have included your mission and vision, but really all of you guys understand what your purpose is for your business and really hanging on to that and then building upon that. So using these foundational concepts to help um, with um, just establishing strategy and um, really helping you be successful or, or, or helping you to pivot as changes arise um, that are either in your control or not. Hey, Carla, this is Leander. Mm -hmm. um, um, how do you uh, put a policy into place if you're the, if you're the only one running the business? Um, for instance, um, I go out and uh, do a farrier service for uh, horse owners. And um, so how would that play into the role of putting my own policies in? That's a really good question. Um, and again, I think with policies, you can, the nice thing is you have the flexibility to um, make it your own. So um, I think the policies that I shared were really kind of those robust ones that referenced regulations. Um, but learning from my um, one of my bosses in the internal audit department, he essentially said, you know, policies really are making sure that you're following the rules, whether the rules come from federal, state government, or even your local organization. So um, one of the things that we, what we did for the internal audit department was we actually just put policies together that showed um, we are going to carry out our duties in accordance in uh, based on our employment contract because um, NAU defines employees um, in different categories. We are going to basically not break rules, <laughs> um, whatever those might be. Um, we are going to operate with integrity because NAU had a code of conduct. Um, and then lastly, um, we are going to operate in a manner that is professional and courteous with our stakeholders. So it was one that was, it pretty much met the needs of regulations, because obviously there's a general statement in there that I'm not gonna break rules, but then also spoke to the constituents that were involved, right? Being professional and working with um, constituents, who, whoever those might be defined as, whether that's the Arizona Board of Regents or 
um, a fellow employee or colleague within the college. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you again, everybody. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Change Labs. I am just thrilled that there is um, a support system there for Native American entrepreneurs um, because they're, we're talented and skilled and we can do stuff. It's just awesome. And, and I'm glad that there's, and thankful that there's a platform and conduit that can help promote those, encourage that. So um, this is awesome. So thank you again. Thank you, Carletta. <clears throat> um, so I just wanted to note too, that a lot of the members here are part of the Chains Labs incubator program. Um, so a lot of them are in the startup phase or the idea phase of their business under the program. And so it's really exciting for them to get exposed to this information because I'm not sure if we touched on it um, within the incubator program just yet. But so, so thank you for providing all of this. And then um, are you, for your business, are you accepting clients? I know we get a lot of questions that um, Native entrepreneurs are now, are also looking for Native CPAs and accountants to help them with their business. Yes, I am definitely accepting um, clients. I will say I am staying away from the T word, taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, my specialty really um, is related to accounting services, whether that's policy analysis, um, whether that's reading loan agreements, whether that's structuring how your business is um, set up. Um, there's a lot of systems and tools out there. And for um, my my team in the College of Business, we use MS Teams. I don't know if uh, folks have used that tool before, but it is a great platform to help you organize your information. Um, and, and for us, um, because of the many places where information can be, we leverage that um, in many ways to keep our or keep our information organized, and it just helps us to be more efficient. But yes, I am definitely taking on clients. I just don't do taxes. <laughs> Sounds great. And then there's a question from Carrie says, how about partnership percentage analysis? I'm thinking about um, taking on an investor, but I don't know what percentage I should give up for capital, depending on, you know, that kind of rate. Um, being 51% Native American owned, it would have to come out of my wife's percentage. <laughs> but <laughs> We have to keep that balance right, and uh, I don't know exactly how much I should give up for the capital investment. So I'm guessing this individual is non-native. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that could be something that we could talk further about. Um, there are definitely um, rules and regulations regarding that, and obviously becoming familiar with even on the Navajo Nation side of it, um, because if you're registered with the Navajo Nation, I know that there's a certain expectation for you to have a certain percentage where it is Native American owned. So if we wanted to touch base, we can always connect offline if you wanted to, Terry. Great. And then, Carletta, one more question. Do you want me to share your email with everybody yes. here in the chat? Yes, if you can share the Red House accounting. Yeah. Yep, perfect. All right. So there in the chat is Carletta's email if you want to take note of that. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your presentation. I took a bunch of notes myself. So I'm really excited to, to put this information to use. I hope everyone else here has the same intentions as well. Uh, thank you for coming, for everyone else. I had a last minute cancellation and Carletta came in and saved the day and presented this information for us and threw her presentation together like a professional. And I'm really excited. I'm really happy you were here to present for everybody. So thank you again, Carletta. <clears throat> and everyone else, thank you for here being here as well. I'm going to share my screen one more time just to share my email address again. So if you have any questions about today's presentation or my part of the presentation earlier, um, you can definitely reach out to me. My email is here, Raquel at nativestartup.org. Or if you want any more information on anything that any of the programs and services that Change Labs has to offer, our website is nativestartup.org. That's all we have for today. We're almost at time, we have 15 minutes left to go. Um, I do have another presentation or workshop coming up in a few weeks, but I'm not quite ready to present that yet. So keep an eye on our social media and our website accounts, and then we'll have those posted shortly. And if anyone else, if nobody else has any questions, we will end for the day.
All right. So if I, if you guys are planning to be in Flagstaff for all roads, the all roads lead to Chaco Canyon uh, conference this week, I will see you there. Or if you're in the Flagstaff area <clears throat> and you want to see any of the Change Labs members, I see we have Christine online right now. I did see, uh, oh, we have Tim as well. Tim, he's one of our coaches as well. As Christine is direct, the director of our kinship blending program. So if you have an established business and you are in need of financial literacy, um, or if you want to learn anything about Christine's program and the benefits of her program there, she will be on site. <clears throat> Or you can go. You can go online and book an appointment with her as well. So thank you all for being here. Oh, hi Tim. Uh, we will see you all later. If you guys are in the area, come say hi. Okay, everyone. Safe travels. Take care. I will see you all next time. Have a great day. Bye.